the data is that uh, Brazilian game developers, uh, they consider government related issues like taxes, bureaucracy, formal work contracts, the biggest challenge for the development of the national gaming labor market. On the other hand, more personal factors such as workers' creativity, is networking, and the mutual friendship are listed as strengths in the country. Um, what I found remarkable about it is that it relates uh, somehow with other ethnographies uh, in video game working places like the, the one did by Ergin Bullet in a AAA studio in USA. And in this uh, research, Bullet talks about how love and camaraderie among workers and friendship and the feeling of loving video game, it's important to attach their, the workers to their jobs. Even then, this kind of uh, career is very unstable and precarious. It's a kind of a precarity that's different from precarity in Brazil. In Brazil, precarity is linked to informal economy and uh, we have poor public politics in gaming development and cultural development in general and cultural industry. And we don't have a triple A industry as the United States and Japan and another and other big hubs, but we have this kind of precarity in other way, and the feeling of loving games and loving your co-worker is important too. It's also a very uh, a highly gendered feeling, uh, highly gendered re personal relationships, because networking among men is easier than among women. So this kind of male working environment is important to create this kind of easy networking that workers uh, perceive as a strength in Brazilian ga gaming industry. And Burial talk about it uh, using the concept of boyhood, this kind of a very formal relationships among men. And uh, other finding we find it remarkable is creativity as a strength, uh, like Siciliano ethnographic research in phonographic, phonographic and YouTube content industry in USA. Um, he found uh, similar uh, results uh, about creativity being perceived as a uh, good quality to uh, attach yourself to your work, to your job. So feeling creative is important to feel attached to my work. And in Brazil, creativity is perceived through the lens of gambiarra because Brazilian workers, they are very proud of themselves, of finding creative solutions for problems. And the gambiarra is important. It's a cultural thing that is important among Brazilian workers. And they, as Siciliano discussing his ethnography, he, they expand the concept of creativity as not only creative work as sometimes in common sense, we think about it like painting, drawing and composing and this kind of artistic activities, but uh, like managerial activities and programming and the technical works, they see create, uh, you can do a gambiarra in programming. So this kind of creativity is important too. So, what Alinea I want to discuss in future developments, uh, our hypothesis is that entrepreneurial ideology and here in Brazil, it's, it is mixed with this kind of do-it-yourself spirit and gambiarra spirit and piracy, all these things uh, that are strategies that your industry found to deal with precarity and being a so global context country. So we don't think that we can look at a neoliberal ideology and entrepreneurial ideology in Brazil like we look at it in USA. So we want to use these concepts at, as starting points to discuss it uh, in Brazilian logic. Um, here, uh, as I said, we, the, the developers they see, the game developers they see 
governmental support, uh, they like it and they want more governmental support, but at the same time, all the governmental related things like taxes and all the things that are about the regulation, they reject it. They don't want regulation. So this is a very neoliberal thing. They want only the support, but not the regulation. And despite recognizing is networking as a strength, they don't think about unions at all. It's not even mentioned in the census. They think about uh, entrepreneurial associations, very focused on markets like networking and um, mentorship or job consulting advice, but not about unions or social change or laws, regulation, not about it. And we have some independent collectives trying to fill this gap that the lack of unions left in our market job. So we, Aline and I discussed it in a previous paper. We talked about uh, Peteca and Firma Game Dev. Uh, they are two collectives of workers that do this kind of networking and safe space uh, think, but they are not unions and don't, they don't act like unions. And for future developments, we want to analyze it specifically how this kind of entrepreneurial and mainstream market related ideology is absorbed and remixed in the Brazilian context and its connection to the entrepreneurial discourse and some far right opinion leaders, many of them connected to Bolsonarism. So this kind of neoliberal agenda here in Brazil, we have a lot of gamers, uh, digital influencers that supports Bolsonaro and talk about be, being rich, how to be rich, how to be an entrepreneur and how to make uh, play games and being rich playing games. So it's a very mixed thing. And that's, these are our reference. Thank you very much for watching. And those are our contacts as well. Thank you. Thank you both. It's interesting to see like two ends of this timeline here uh, to think about the industry. So I'm sure that'll be a fruitful place for conversation as we move forward. Our next talk is somewhere on my, where did I put it? I put it over here. <laughs> um, our next talk is gaming technology and the migratory phenomena, the case of Dusa Codas. I believe this is being presented by uh, Leo Gomez today, so. Thank you. Um, it's a beautiful intro, <laughs> uh, but um, I think my colleague Hector will say a couple of words before I actually dive into the presentation. Great. Um, thank you um, to the Thomas Harris Institute for Hispanic and International Communication and the College of Media Communication at Texas Tech, Nick Bauman, uh, Kent uh, Wilkinson and our moderators, Bobby uh, Schweizer and Lauren Acosta for uh, organizing the conference and gathering and for the opportunity to present and share our experience and analysis. I've learned a lot so far from the presentations and it's a real pleasure to follow Alina and Beatrice's uh, really inspiring work on the kind of worker experience. And our uh, presentation and paper has a uh, similar, more sociological approach. Uh, as we all know in recent years, uh, and by the way, this is work uh, uh, in, in, done in, con in conjunction with a Dominicanos USA, a nonprofit organization that works uh, with the Dominican diaspora in the US. And you'll hear more details uh, from, from, from Leo uh, in the presentation. But to provide a little context, as you know, in recent years, the academic literature and immigration has begun to recognize the multiple roles uh, that community-based organizations play in supporting the migration process, in supporting the adaptation and incorporation of immigrants, their representation, and the various connections between immigrant mm. communities and populations and communities in the countries of origin. Advances in transportation, telecommunications, and the globalization of entertainment, media, and gaming technologies and platforms has given rise to what is often referred to as transnational communities. In transnational migration and in, in that literature, the emphasis is not so much in the here or the there, 
but on the simultaneity of the experience, on the fact that networks, ties, and connections are simultaneously developed and maintained in immigrant sending and receiving communities. Uh, and more recently, uh, uh, the focus of the literature has been how nation states can harness uh, the support and connections between diaspora communities and countries and communities of origin in order to promote uh, economic and, and other types of, uh, of development. Uh, this paper describes the experience of a Dominican diaspora organization, uh, Dominicanos USA, with the use of gaming in order to build connections between diasporic communities, uh, so-called digital diasporas, and the country of origin, and promote the diversification of the gaming industry and the recognition of Latinos in gaming, and also to use gaming as a platform and opportunity to promote community economic development across borders. The initiative, which we'll describe and Leo will get into in a second, is called DUSA Codes, and also seeks to leverage Latino experiences and expertise in developing the industry. Um, so I'll let my colleague, uh, uh, Leo Gomez, uh, uh, present the case study, and we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much. Leo, take it away. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, um, so, you know, um, I've been working, a you know, quick background on a little bit about me. I've been working with DUSA for a little, a little bit over five years now. Um, we wear different hats and I'm loving this approach that we've um, programmed. And I I do appreciate the opportunity that we've been given to present this beautiful approach. And maybe we can showcase a little bit about the fruition and our experience that we've had with this program in the last year or so. So the developing meaningful connections between Dominican, Dominican Americans and Dominican Republic, um, gaming technology and the migratory phenomenon, the case of DUSA codes. So, um, in 2013, a group of insightful donors from the Dominican Republic joined forces with the Dominican American leaders to create Dominicanos USA. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonpartisan organization that is committed to the civic, social, and economic integration of Dominican Americans into the fabric of the American society. So what we've been doing prior to the DUSA Codes initiative uh, boils down to you know, voter registration, um, citizenship, and even sometimes we, you know, we work with the workforce development to kind of, you know, assist our community to find jobs. So we've been very community oriented um, these last couple of years. And this new opportunity, I think, can expand on that. Um, this undertaking is a recognition that it's fully integrated citizen is vital to the well-being of the Dominican American and the Dominican Republic. DUSA strives to ensure that every U.S. citizen is able to freely exercise their civic rights, realize their full potential, and capitalize on all opportunities the United States has to offer. Our contribution to making this vision a reality begins with our work in the Dominican American community. Um, a quick brief summary about our mission. Um, like I said, we give them a voice through civic, social, and economic engagement, integration, all of the above. And we understand that a firmly rooted and properly engaged citizen of the Dominican descent, of Dominican descent can be an invaluable resource for addressing critical needs of the Dominican Republic. Okay, one second. So what do we do? Uh, be, besides bridging the connections between Dominican Americans and the Dominican Republic, aided by US know-how and prop proprietary data, we, are, we love data, um, and unique deployment of tech applications that we've recently implemented DUSA aims to identify and organize Dominican Americans around their communities of interest. In this particular case, we are talking about gaming, um, gaming communities, forums, Discord servers um, in the Dominican Republic and here in the US. Um, we're trying to build a connection between these communities, um, a meaningful connection between the Dominican American and the Dominican Republic related to their respective interests, also gaming, um, maybe tech, anything, you know, it's an umbrella. Uh, journalism, whatever, if it's gaming related, um, if it's civic engagement, um, we, we want it to, we want a connection to happen there. And we will leverage um, our, you know, Dominican Americans wider embedded networks, what we have with that. We also have resources that we want to introduce, valuable ones, um, products, goods, and services within the context of these targeted networks. Um, so for example, well, I'll, I'll actually dwell into that in a bit. Um, 
and mobilize resources to address issues of critical importance in the Dominican Republic and prioritize issues in accordance with the Caribbean Diaspora Engagement Act. Uh, here are some of our main donor, donors, um, Inicia, Carnegie Corporation, New York Community Trust, Naleo, um, Grupo Punta Cana, Central Romana, um, all amazing organizations that, you know, they have helped us with civic engagement, voter registration, citizenship um, events. Also FYI, our citizens, our citizenship events are all in virtual. We've created this awesome, you know, program to make sure that we can continue the events during the pandemic. And it has been amazing. Um, a lot of bugs that we had to deal with, but it worked out for the best. Um, a couple more partners. We work with the New York Historic Society, um, the NYC Votes. You probably heard of them. It's, you know, CUNY Citizenship Now, GAMHC, NIMIC, um, the US Census, um, and Citizenship, citizenship Works. Um, one of our recent partnerships um, was signing an MOU with an international, with the International Organization for Migration in May of 2021. Here we have Josue Gasto Bondo. He's the chief of mission and Manuel Matos, our amazing DUSA president, um, who, by the way, um, this is his idea. He kind of like just pulled me and he's like, hey, you play video games? Um, I have this awesome idea that you should expand on. And I'm like, great, awesome, let's do this. And, um, you know, his, they, the, the signing of the MOU was to create a bond to implement and pro promote programs designed to create connections between the Dominican diaspora and the Dominican Republic, which we've heard numerous times now through this presentation, but we want to reiterate that. Um, an another recent um, partnership that we signed an MOU with was with the Foreign Ministry of the Dominican Republic, represented by Vice Minister of the Dominican Community Abroad, Carlos de la Mota, with the objective to leverage DUSA's capabilities in support of the government's policies for forming meaningful connections and co-development between the diaspora and the Dominican Republic. This would, this would as you, you're going to see in a couple minutes, this is going to provide a whole, a whole entire new universe of connections when it comes to our, you know, gaming and tech side of things. Um, and during all, you know, some of these also, partners also include the Dominican uh, Republic branch of Girls in Tech. Um, the Foreign Ministry and the International Organization for Migration served as official witnesses to the signing of the cooperation agreements between DUSA and the Santo Domingo chapter of, of Girls in Tech, as well as with the Dominican Republic's Esports Federation. Um, the agreement provided for DUSA codes program scholarships for member, provides for DUSA codes program scholarships for members of these Dominican based organizations. So, um, DUSA codes. Um, DUSA makes real world connections um, with the Dominican Americans here and the Dominican Republic. We start by identifying the US gaming community here, Dominican American gamers, um, what they're into, gaming, coding, and um, what to provide as well as identifying and organizing around the community of interests, one, and making a meaningful connection to the DR. So this bridge gets uh, you know, fortified with you know, mutual interests. Uh, some of our partners do include uh, Microsoft, Playcrafting, League of Legends, Avaria, Avaria um, VS, sorry, and U.S. tech schools. Um, so connected with, so number, step three is to connect with embedded U.S. networks and then leverage the network to boost the yarn STEM U.S. market opportunities for the Dominican coders and gamers in the, in the U.S. And, here in the, and in the Dominican Republic as well. Um, we also introduce DUSA services and resources both to STEM and tech, which are big um, schools over there, huge schools um, that are focused on tech development, game development, and the DR, as well as, you know, also leveraging that resource here. Um, I think this is a study based on Pew Research. Um, Hispanics are the top demographic group to self-identify as gamers but let make up less than seven percent of the game developers so um that's interesting little fun fact for you guys we also had a cool event um that resulted in the inception of q league it's a um, Hiskeya league it's a u.s club sanctioned by the fdde fdde uh, 
um, Dominican Esports Federation, which we had, we signed something earlier with in the previous slides. The event generated partnerships for development of coder programs with the DR educational institutions and Playcrafting, the largest gaming software developer network in the US. Um, that was a pretty fun um, event. The Dominican, the meet was hosted, I think, on oh, October 7th. Um, it was at the Microsoft Technology Center in Times Square. Um, they provided everything we needed in terms of space, logistics. It was, a, it was awesome. Um, we also managed to facilitate important connections between these companies um, and tech education partners in the, in the Dominican Republic. So there was, we also had panelists talking. Um, I know Playcrafting's Dan Bushko did a couple, um, said a couple words. Manny, I also did, Avaria's creator. And we actually had the FDDE tune in via Zoom and also say a little bit um, about the event. Um, these are some pictures um, so here on the, you can see that some of the pictures have a couple of different organizations. We have the Tekken um, 7 NYC club showing, um, showcasing in the back. In the front, we have the Hearst Boys, which is, these are all predominantly also FGC fighting game um, community um, teams. Um, we, we, the games we chose were Smash, Street Fighter, and uh, Tekken. So in this particular event, it was focused on the fighting game community, which is a, you know, a sub community within the entire gamers community. Um, second and third generation Dominican Americans were able to participate in Dominican E-Force Federation events through the Inflation Q League. That was super fun. Um, here we have a, a couple of our networks and visualized so you guys can see where our resources come from. We have um, resources from the you know, Microsoft Connection. Um, we have the US STEM Foundation kind of supporting us. We have QLE, of course, FDDE. East Encore Esports is a lounge in New Rochelle. They're, it's a beautiful gaming lounge, which they bought peripherals to the event um, to kind of support it. Gamertag Radio. Um, owned by Danny Pena, who is also now part of X-Play, plays a big role on our panels. HB, of course, they play a huge role in bringing the people into the events and play crafting, plays a huge role creating these opportunities for the people that do attend the events. Um, so a couple of little, um, a couple of targeted and comprehensive development of a new vertical of the digital economic in the DR. So, Video, video gaming and marketing application industry was estimated to be one, wow, 159 billion in 2020. Our objective is to develop an ecosystem compromised by consumer adoption, right? By through coding, which is through the codes and commercial absorption, et cetera. So um, uh, the idea is to spur the development of a robust stable gaming program. So basically they would go through our classes and not have to stress from you know looking at jobs. We would have that those resources ready for them as soon as they graduate or finish our um, finish our program, which is usually eight weeks. Um, so, and on top of this, we are aiming to create a new digital economy economy sector in the DR, which will um, you know start by working directly with big name triple A gamers. I mean triple A developers like Sony. Um, Google Stadia, Microsoft, Activision, et cetera. Also corporate clients, both in the Dominican Republic and abroad through partnerships and entities like Playcrafting and some of the partners we mentioned before, um, directly with companies and consumer products, goods in particular, financial services and tourism industries, which are predominantly important in the Dominican Republic and incentivize indie game development that can be monetized and commercialized through platforms such as Steam um, because almost all the developers from the DR are indie developers, right? Um, a couple of little fun facts here on the right, which include that 25 new games are released Yo, every day. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You go, go ahead. But, but um, there's another presentation still. Okay. Um, if you could give us like the one more minute version. Yeah, for I sure, I know you have sure. a lot of information. If you can just focus on the binational event. I'm yes, of course. That, I think that'd be terrific, thank you. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so the binational event, well, so far we've um, been creating, um, we've been working on creating these curriculums that help the kids, like, as I mentioned. And um, the binational event will focus on um, creating a network of 
you know, students so they can kind of have access to the opportunities and um, use our resources and kind of also um, leverage them to kind of also fortify. So basically we would have all these students and um, congregate and work with the DR team. And we'll be having, you know, tournaments and stuff like that weekly to kind of fortify that um, and free plays. I know another um, presentation mentioned some free plays and we'll kind of cover that through Q League um, support and Lucid Code support and kind of building this huge network that can also probably eventually be emulated with other um, organizations or countries of a sort. Um, I'm sorry it was cut short. That's basically it. I wish I had more time, um, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Professor, um, for your intro. And if you guys have any Q questions, I know the president, Manny, volunteered to answer some of them. I know um, I wish I would have finished this in time, but I'm sorry about that. No, thank you. I'm sure that there will be an opportunity for some of the other information that you have to come out during the Q&A. So uh, someone will probably ask a question that you already had a slide for. So <laughs> that'd be great. It's interesting to hear about uh, another direction of a network flow where we're um, going back and forth between the Dominican Republic and the US. So thank you so much. Uh, last off here, our final talk for this afternoon is on the Hispanic and Latin experiences in the esports industry, um, presented by uh, Robert Velasco from the Texas Scholastic Esports Federation. So you probably you should just be able to share your screen. Check our messages here. If you're having difficulty with any of it, you can send any of us a message. As I'm holding the space bar, let's see. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I'll get just going and start it real quick here. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Able to see now. We can see all your slides. All right. All right. We've got them. Excellent. All right. Well, so my name is Roberto Velasco. I am a co founder of the Texas Scholastic Esports Federation. And I am also a doctoral student proposing a uh, my dissertation on the perceptions of teachers and how they see the social, emotional, and academic outcomes of uh, students participating in esports, scholastic esports specifically, those sponsored by uh, teachers or by school personnel. Uh, either co-curricular or extracurricular in, uh, in schools nationwide. Uh, and I think this is a very important topic, uh, specifically in today's day and age, uh, because we are at a stage in the development of esports where a lot of schools are um, hearing from many of you guys, many in the in the industry and many uh, real proponents of esports uh, in schools, yet there is not a lot of data that supports or um, or has any sort of specific uh, guidance for school administrators on how 
participation affects students one way or the other. Uh, so uh, specifically talking about Hispanic and Latin uh, students, we don't have a lot of data and that's that's an area that we need to focus our research on specifically uh, looking at what demographics um, in the area of esports how they fall specifically talking about uh, scholastic and you know what percentage of students how they're doing and how they're responding um, one uh, study or yeah, one statistic source that we have um, tells us that uh, the level of interest in esports in, in the United States by ethnicity uh, follows as as we can see on the screen, uh, with uh, Hispanic having uh, some of the largest uh, percentages of uh, interest in the field of esports uh, as avid fans. We have 16% and 26% as casual fans. And we can clearly see that there is a high level of interest in, uh, in the field and in the um, area of esports by, by Hispanic students. Yet when we see representation in middle and high school esports leagues, uh, we see uh, a bit of a different story. Um, this is from the uh, UC Irvine study that HS HSCL published, and, and granted, this is not a nationwide uh, sample. It's a smaller sample with respondents in, in a much smaller uh, demographic area, but yet yeah, the numbers don't coincide, right? So uh, what we can sort of uh, deduce from this is that there is a need for more inclusion uh, efforts on on the parts of schools and on on behalf of uh, league and tournament organizers to increase the uh, the reach of uh, esports participation, specifically speaking uh, about the the Hispanic and Latinx community. Again, while the interest is there. Um, you know, we see a high level of interest. We don't see equally high levels of participation. So that that tells us there is a a disconnect, right? Um, and that may just be uh, a problem of uh, not providing enough opportunities, not providing enough uh, access. And you know, it, it's up to us, right, to make it happen for for every child and every student. Uh, when it comes to uh, to the same demographics, we look at uh, you know, the age range of those students enrolled in uh, esports programs. It's it's fairly uh, repre representative of what we would see in a, in a high school environment. So it's it's not whether some students are getting it or not is the the age range is pretty representative, but the demographics are not. So again, we may need to be able to look at where and when these uh, these programs are being offered. Uh, as far as my uh, research goes, I am uh, going to be looking at the uh, the perceived effects of esports participation. Uh, we are going to break it down by demographics, and once that uh, research and those results are ready, I'll be really happy to share it with you guys. Um, but so far, um, the results indicate that the outcomes for all students seem to be extremely uh, beneficial. Um, increased interest in uh, STEM careers, in increased um, uh, sense of belonging to the school, socially and emotionally, students are benefiting tremendously. Uh, and the mentorship part with the with the adults who are leading these esports programs are becoming extremely beneficial to students. So, I think that is going to be very important for us to look at uh, increasing 
access, increasing opportunity, not just for um, some subsets of the population, but um, also specifically targeting those who have been historically excluded from uh, a full um, gamut of opportunity. Uh, you know, in this in this case, um, we we may want to look at increasing the access for Hispanic and Latinx students. Well, that's uh, that's what I got for now. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Look forward to seeing the further results of the data. I mean, this this also connects well with our a question from this morning. So I'm actually I'm, I'm going to start with that one. Well, there's there's sort of a a question I think here that's raised in bond, uh, by a couple of people. Um, so. There's a question from Phil, and I think it applies perhaps to the, the same conversation here, um, but originally it was from for Leo, or intended for Leo, so Leo could take a crack at this first. Like sports, esports, and game culture in general are often disproportionately male-dominated. In what way does DUSA address gender equity? And Dr. Uh, Cordero, you could also field this one as well. Okay, I can, I can knock this one. That's a great question. Um, you know, it's very important for us to make sure that, you know, I don't know, I don't like using the word inclusive. I don't know, you know, we also, that it's, we're as inclusive, because I, I wish I just had a better term for it, but um, that we are as inclusive as possible. Um, all our events will always have a safe space. I just want to make that clear. And, you know, it's something we've actually spoken about. And it, and it's, it was actually brought up to our team, you know, our actual Dominican USA team is predominantly women. Um, it's only like two of us are male actually. And we always get questions asked like, um, why is it that, you know, the communities tend to be disproportionately male dominated? And in what ways do, you know, can we change that? Um, it's the little things that we can, that I personally noticed through my experience for example, in like the fighting game community, it's a fighting game community. So there's this preconceived notion that there a little bit of aggressiveness, aggressiveness goes a long way and um, sportsmanship sometimes goes out the window. And for some reason, when it comes to, you know, towards players that are women, um, there's always uh, some sort of um, generalization when it comes to that. And we've seen it happen in our events and we tend to address it appropriately um, but in regards to the gender equity portion, we do make, you know, Girls in Tech is a big, big partner for us. One of our first partners, which predominantly, which they're, they will guide us into making sure that everything that we do, um, isn't disproportion and that, and they would, you know, they would teach us the ways and making the place, uh, our events, a safer place and a more less stressful sp space, um, as well. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. I think that's something that needs to be addressed in all, um, not just esports as well as sports. And it's, it's a great question that I wish one of my colleagues, you know, were able, should be able, were, would had the opportunity to answer. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. And maybe, um, Roberto, if you had a, a thought on that same question as well, um, just thinking about the the data that you've looked at so far, um, what are you looking for in terms of uh, representation and and people who are interested in in playing games and participating in esports? Yeah, so uh, I'll tell you the the approach that I'm taking to this is is uh, phenomenological uh, and really looking at more of a qualitative look at uh, you know what are the experiences that students and, and teachers are having with esports uh, so what i can tell you is that from the conversations that i've had with uh, especially female gamers um, or gamers who identify as female right and a lot of times that comes across through the uh you know, through the use of voice chat or 
simply a, a gamer tag, right? Uh, the, the female identity comes through. And what they are reporting is that they immediately are subject to, uh, to harassment a lot of times. So that drives away a lot of the interest from um, girl or female identifying gamers. They, they don't want anything to do with it, uh, or they hide their identity not so as to not be uh, harassed. They either go on mute or they, you know, they just don't play. Uh, and that's something that, that we need to address uh, very uh, intentionally. Ironically, um, well, let me backtrack a little bit. When we have adults in the room, though, Right when we have a teacher or a coach or a mentor in the room with an esports team, that changes everything, um, and that's one of the things that TechSF, um, the Texas Classic Esports Federation, and and myself especially, we've been huge proponents of uh, of having a, an adult in the room that can moderate and exemplify the uh, the the set of values and culture of inclusion of everyone that we want to see in, in the field in general. Um, some folks have taken the approach of, of being more inclusive by being more exclusive. Uh, for example, making all girl teams and having them in separate rooms, which may be a good start, but in the end, we, we definitely want um, a more inclusive uh, multi-gender community for sure, but uh, it's going to take some time and some some real strategic effort. Great, thank you. So I'm going to direct a question now um, back to Alina and Beatriz. Uh, this was from Regina, who asked, so many workers in the game industry in the U.S. are anti-union, libertarian, and it seems like this is the case for Brazilian games industry workers as well, based on the presentation. What do you think is the cause of these similar politics in contexts that are somewhat similar, Trump, Bolsonaro, but also quite different? Um, and is it something about how we educate workers for the game industry or something else going on? Yes, I think that's about how we educate gaming uh, workers in the gaming industry and about gaming culture itself. Uh, the idea of, uh, of competitive and the male atmosphere, like this idea of the male hero, uh, a lonely hero to do it against all the odds. And the fact that in gaming industry uh, is seen as a dream job. So they feel that they need to be grateful for working in gaming industry. I felt it working in media industry. I worked in media industry for a time and it's very alike. And I believe that's the fact that it leads this kind of gaming ideology at working environments. I don't know if Dalini can complement. Yes, I guess, I guess I can, I can add a few things and uh, one of the things it is that we have a, a related scenario uh, with both developers and players or, or gamers. Um, they both support a discourse against policies from the government, but also ask for the, the government interference, as uh, Beatrice mentioned earlier. And this scenario is not recent, and I believe it goes back when uh, the, the, the industry uh, started to, to, to work. And back in the, the context of uh, cloning and piracy, and because that was not actually made by uh, a group of uh, just people from the left or uh, with pro uh, progressive perspectives, let's say. And they just want to take advantage of an opportunity, you know. And also, I guess in the last decade, we, we have seen a growth uh, of the far right, as all the world uh, have seen. Uh, and here we have this iconic uh, character, Bolsonaro, 
but not only him in the country, of course. And video game culture in the country is also very toxic, as we, we know in, in other places. And effectively, it uh, embraced gamer games, of course. We have this uh, very strong here in the country. So uh, Bolsonaro and his perspectives, they matched. And uh, about the gaming courses, uh, I believe uh, they, they do not move towards showing a path to, to teach people to think about beyond uh, COVID. Yeah, and um, what I see today in the in these courses, it is a um, a tone of entrepreneurship. It is what they teach for the students nowadays. So yes, uh, it relates to how we educate uh, workers for the game industry. And I I don't know if we can change this in the next few years. Yes, I believe that a problem is that they don't even consider unions because they don't even know about it. We had a uh, mobilization against Twitch in Brazil last year, because, last year because Twitch changed the rules for payments for uh, streamers. And people sometimes was like, oh, a union is a possibility, so we can do it. So they start to think about it for the first time. And so I believe that we need to talk more about this kind of thing, like labor mobilization and work environment act ethics in the game courses, like Eileen said. Yeah, it's, I'm thinking about the talk that we had over lunch today with Anna Horta and, and how that, that talk seems to me to be inconceivable 10 years ago as a, a person that exists in the industry and, and has a creative director role and, and who's responsible for that. So uh, Phil, you were gonna follow up with a question here. Yes, um, this was the other question that I wrote in the chat for Aline and Beatriz. Um, Great talk, and uh, I wanted to ask if you think there's any way that we can apply your research to informal labor or immaterial labor practices outside of the game industry itself. And it may be that that doesn't really apply to your research, but I just wonder if you see any connections. I'm thinking about streamers and esports competitors as kind of giving away labor for free while the game platforms and publishers are profiting uh, for their free labor. I'm super happy with this question because this is what I'm doing in my PhD research. So great, great. yes, I'm working with male streamers who organize themselves in co feminist collectives. So yes, that's my focus. I want to understand because feminism among gaming streamers, it's also co-opted, but, but by this kind of logic, like we needed to make a lot of free labor for the call for the calls for the feminism. And sometimes we have this very abusive working dynamics inside uh, social activism. So I'm um, specifically specifically in my research, I'm looking at this kind of thing among gaming streamers, female game streamers who identify themselves as feminists. I guess we we could apply. Oh no! It seems to have happened again. Analyze the data. <laughs> okay. Or. Well, Alina, I think you came back at the end, but you cut off at the beginning of your comment. Oh, okay. So, I I agree. I agree with uh, with Beatriz, and and one of the things that I I, I think about this this group you mentioned, it is that they are not aware that they are uh, at the margins of their relations with the platforms they are using. Uh, for me, it is the, the the greatest problem, and without realizing this, that they what they produce is in the control of the platform. Uh, they are not aware that they are in this, this part of the precariat. 
and this is something that uh, we should uh, uh, find a way to show to them in how we can do this i'm not uh, so sure but uh, it is this this situation happening now and and we try to 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 discuss with these groups in a way that uh, we are not judging them because as as Beatrice said uh, we have this form of feminism that is a, a very liberal feminism as we can do we uh, we have girl power and all these this stuff and they don't they don't see the problems behind it and I believe we can we can try to do, to, to do a, a similar uh, approach to to these groups for sure. Thank you. Thank you both. I don't see anything else on the Zoom chat here. This if there's anybody who is feeling brave and talkative and wants to unmute and ask a question, please feel free to. I have something in my Back pocket here if no one does, but I'd love to hear someone else. Yeah, I'd like to to ask uh, Leo about sort of the community reaction um, to your project. What do you, what would you identify as as sort of falling in line with y'all's goals versus things that you still need to to work on in terms of just knowledge, you know, and and engagement with your with your communities, uh, you know, both in the U.S. and the Dominican Republic. Okay, I'm gonna see if the professor or Manny would like to answer this one. Um, thank you so much. The answer is no, and you're on the spot. <laughs> yep, you got that right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, let me um, let me give you a little context, Leo. I, yes. I find this as somebody who teaches international communication, I find this really interesting in terms of the concept of diaspora and the way that you know digital media can be used to maintain those connections between communities. In this situation, as far as I understand, a pretty you know fluid moving community, you know, back Most and definitely. forth um, mm -hmm. with with uh, you know a lot of familial ties and you know associations and and that sort of thing that you were talking about. So in terms of this um concept of diaspora and you know sort of cutting edge media that's that younger people would be interested in i find it really uh fascinating honestly and that was in a way oh, um uh, uh, the, the goal of this activity in the context of the overall set of activities that dusa engages in the idea was that many of the traditional media that occupy both spaces are targeted a very different demographic, a much older demographic, a demographic that may be more nostalgic in its approach uh, to, to both their presence in the US and the home country. And there was a sense of how, how, how does one reach the younger generation, right? The younger generation of Dominicans growing in the US, which are growing in the in the, in the here and, 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 in, and in the there, and the generation of Dominicans there who through media and, and other influences are in a way globally connected, right? Uh, and, and, and gaming uh, 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 became the, the mechanism and the vehicle where, where one could reach young Dominican Americans, when work, where one could reach young Dominicans in the Dominican Republic, and more interestingly, where actually one could bring them together. And uh, the, the, the one event that, uh, we, that DUSA uh, did in uh, December uh, 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 was in a shopping center in the Dominican Republic and in an organization in the Bronx and, and, and in the Dominican Republic, it was basically like a showcasing and a, and a, and a gaming fair. And, and in, in, in the organization in the Bronx, it was basically like a community a, a space event. And it was basically an all day tournament where players from the US side were playing with or, or against, with, against uh, uh, 
uh, players uh, uh, on, on the Dominican side. Uh, uh, and, 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 and the game and the gaming platform was essentially was bringing uh, these two groups uh, that, were, that were in two different places, but, but experiencing and living a simultaneous reality together at the same time in the same virtual space and place. And in fact, interacting with each other and getting to know each other and getting to build relationships with each other. And in that sense, also the gender aspect is interesting because one of the things that the gaming platform allows as it relates to gender issues is that you may not necessarily know the quote unquote gender of the player that you're playing with. And sometimes it doesn't even matter, right? Uh, 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 you're playing against two, three, A, B, 12. Uh, uh, and, and, and we had many instances in which uh, 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 there were expectations or assumptions that the player on the other side was a male or a female. In fact, it really wasn't. So in that, in that learning experience and in that contacting, you start in a way confronting and maybe potentially even challenging your own stereotypes about uh, um, who's on the other side, right? Um, so, that, so that to me was what was, what was interesting, how, how gaming became the vehicle, the platform, and the mechanism where, where, where two groups of kids that are, yes, connected through family and other networks became connected through this, through this activity. And the activity wasn't just reflecting their existing networks, but became a network builder itself. So, so the networks that people brought into the relationship are important, but the networks that they develop in the space, the new networks and the new connections that they make uh, 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 with each other and across borders are also important. And, and again, that's, that, that, that to me, or to us, seemed to be something that's unique to gaming because gaming isn't by definition a passive activity. I can be watching a movie in, in a computer and you can be watching the same movie over there, but we're not interacting with each other. Gaming is about interacting uh, with each other. So it brings that, 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 that other dimension, right? Uh, 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 so that's in a way what was interesting about it, what it says about gaming and about the platform, and then what it says about migration and what it says about cross-border relationships, right? And the third dimension is how the organization connects with the, with the ecosystem of companies that are involved and with the government as a, as, a, as a kind of a government strategy to penetrate this sector and start thinking about what is the role of game and gaming in our overall technology and economic development strategy. How, how, how do we connect to the broader world? And, 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 and they're like, well, the Dominican youth in the US is, is, a, is, a, is a primary vehicle and, 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 and way and opportunity to connect. And it was super interesting that one of the interviews uh, that was being done during the day with one of the champions that's in Dominican Republic that won, that won in one of the kind of global tournaments, at some point he starts talking in perfect English. Uh, uh, which is not necessarily the most common thing to see in the streets of the DR, right? You'll have a lot of people that are fluent, uh, but, but certainly there's, been a, there, there's also been, uh, 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 this kid obviously lived part of his life in the US and now is living back in the DR. Uh, uh, so again, it, it's, it, the, the platform uh, 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 and the activity really became a, 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 a connector vehicle at many levels, at the personal, at the organizational, at the country, at the, at, the, at, the, at the kind of diaspora, the community of origin, place of origin kind of level. I don't know if this, and I'm sorry, we really went on almost longer than Leo's presentation, but, uh, but, 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 I, but I hope this helped answer the question and provoke some, some thinking, which I think this kind of conference is by definition designed to try to do. Right, yeah, just a very quick comment on that toward the end when you were talking about um, organizations and how organizations might adapt and, and rethink, you know, their relationships and how to bring in, you know, younger generations. Um, it seems to me that that's, that's a big issue for a number of, you know, these social organizations. I'm thinking of like the Portuguese community in New, New Jersey, for example, that's really having some trouble attracting and, you know, retaining uh, a younger membership, and this is a way that those organizations could also change to be more accommodating. And I, I could think, I would think it would also help their advocacy efforts. You know, political, cultural, economic advocacy, advocacy to be able to sort of speak a language, if you will, that those younger generations can can tune into. Absolutely. And Thanks. the last point regarding the economic development employment connection is 
how, how, how can this be an opportunity to transform the youth from mere consumers of the technology into producers and, and, and generators of that technology, which is where kind of the economic and economic development opportunities reside, right? Uh, so it's not so much about agglomerating and aggregating tons of users. It's about taking that energy and also bringing in the creative uh, programming energy and, 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 and asking, it, can this also be transformative, right? And, and an opportunity for that community to generate new games and generate new activities also, right? Not, not simply be the most sophisticated consumers there could be, but also to hopefully become producers of the kind of next generation of the technology, right? Thanks for the question, by the way, appreciate it. Are there any other questions or things that people want to add on to the conversation that we're having right now? Well, it's been a long but very interesting and productive day as far as I'm concerned. I've really enjoyed the dynamic interaction and the presentations and uh, I really thank uh, all the organizers again for thinking about doing this because I think it's broad. People that work in kind of different uh, uh, areas, but uh, with kind of like a gaming optic. And I think it's led to really interesting and, and beautiful interactions. Agreed. Thank you very much for that, that commentary. And I think that's, I mean, as an outsider, not somebody who does a lot of work in this area, I think that's that's really what the, the space might need, right? In terms of articulating what those those ties are and being opening avenues for people who might not be experts in in you know game culture, but who are interested in industry or who are interested in some of these social dynamics to be able to find touch points and start collaborating with you know you and and others. And that's cer certainly something we hope to do through the uh, Harris Institute in the future. I've I've posted a couple of comments, uh, you know, throughout the day. Hey, you know, great topic. Let's let's talk more about it. And you know, I think there are some some really strong opportunities for collaboration on uh, shared interests that we may not have thought about uh, so actively before. So let's try to record those, and you know, maybe we could have a follow up, sending out, you know, here are some of the key points on things we could we could follow up on in the future. And I'd like to reiterate my suggestion before that y'all be thinking about what might be the next step, right? Um, maybe in a year or so, do something uh, very similar and, and sort of get this to be a, a sort of a, a constant uh, process or an opportunity for people to be, be able to share their, their current work. Um, <clears throat> Let me just say on behalf of the conference organizers, we're really pleased with uh, the quality and the engagement. I think you've surpassed our expectations, not that they were low, I think they were pretty high, but they've been, you know, sort of blown to the stratosphere at this point. And uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and we will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, please do come back. We're going to be starting at uh, nine o'clock. We've got um, two keynotes uh, tomorrow, the first one by uh, Jose Segal, um, and then we have another concluding one at, at one o'clock with uh, Dr. Adrian Shaw and uh, two panels in between there. Uh, panel four, games is text at 10.15, and panel five, uh, games is art and play at uh, 11.45. So it's going to be the same login information. We'll do the same thing in terms of keeping the channel open so there can be discussion between talks and, and all that. Um, so, and, and thank you also to those of you who have had to deal with the time differences and maybe it wasn't very convenient for you to be on at the time that you were scheduled or for the panels you want to listen to. We understand that um, and uh, appreciate your, your participation. So I'll uh, hand it back to uh, Bobby to finish things off. <laughs> that, that's it. No, I, I think you've said everything great. So thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you bright and early in the morning. Um, and again, there's the H-I-H-I-C underscore gaming hashtag on Twitter if you want to follow along. Oh, which just got posted in the Zoom chat as well. So no reason the conversation has to end now. You can be tweeting throughout the night or morning, wherever you are. <laughs> See everybody in the morning. Thanks, y'all. Our, our morning.
Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, -bye. <laughs> I think you just you can leave the Zoom open and then people can be like in here doing yeah. shots, <laughs> playing games. I can I'm start loving your I'm loving your microphone, Bobby. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everybody. You too. I could start streaming to this channel. Is you that your office, Bobby? Yes, right. it is. That's so interesting. It's uh it's books and books and books. <laughs> You're on mute. So it's uh, sad that you weren't able to make it down. Yes. I was uh, looking know. forward to it. Me too. I need to ask, where'd you get that pin? <laughs> that exclusive pin. I said, I don't know. I, I stole it on my way out when I was visiting, I think. <laughs> Not sure. Ashley, Ashley gave it to me. Yeah, I'm wearing the t-shirt version of it. I love it. It's great. We don't. I don't think we have any T-shirts made for our uh, certificate program yet. Maybe when we open up our esports uh, lab, we'll get something done. Doctor Condis has a you jersey. Need a reason to make T-shirts. T-shirts are just always. It should always be coming up. T-shirts for everything. Yeah. Wasn't wasn't that your thing that you just you send students places and always just put them in a shirt? Yes, that was my GDC talk. <laughs> my sometimes misinterpreted GDC talk. <laughs> it's the only thing I remember from it. So clearly, <laughs> yeah. that was the most important takeaway. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to scoot out of here. Uh, but yeah, I'll, we'll uh, talk in the morning. See you tomorrow. Oh, by the way, the Zoom is still recording. If whoever's in charge might want to turn it off. <laughs>